News of the Times Twisted Tales Tuesday Stories of Being Buried Alive Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we gather together tales of people having been buried alive, either accidentally or on purpose, between 1661 and 1935. The fear of being buried alive in Regency and Victorian England was real and based on true events from within England and abroad. We have gathered some of the stories from the papers and also look at the Victorian method of dealing with this very real fear. We hope you enjoy the show. In Victorian England, the fear of being buried alive was a prevalent concern. Limited medical knowledge and the absence of sophisticated techniques to determine death accurately led to genuine worries about the possibility of premature burial. Tales of waking up in coffins and desperate attempts to escape only heightened this collective fear. You can see the reason for this potential fear from the not infrequent stories about being buried alive in pamphlets and papers. Here are a few notable Victorian stories of waking up in coffins. The case of Rosamond Hester Lakin, 1850. Rosamond Lakin, a young woman from Ipswich, was believed to have died of cholera. She was buried in a family vault, but when the vault was opened years later, her body was found in a different position, indicating signs of struggling. It was concluded that she had been buried alive. The story of Margaret Ann Galvin, 1871. Margaret Ann Galvin was an Irish girl who fell ill and was mistakenly declared dead. She was buried in a cemetery in Limerick, Ireland. However, a few days later, a gravedigger heard banging sounds from her grave. They quickly exhumed her, and Margaret was found alive but weak. She was revived and eventually recovered. The case of Alice Blunden, 1884. Alice Blunden, a seven-year-old girl from East Sussex, was thought to have succumbed to diphtheria and was buried. However, her father had a nagging suspicion and had her exhumed. It was discovered that Alice had been buried alive and her body showed signs of struggle. The case of Charlotte Green, 1885. Charlotte Green, a young woman from London, was mistakenly pronounced dead due to a sleeping sickness. She was buried, but when the grave was reopened, signs of her struggle were found. Charlotte was revived and lived for several more years before passing away. The case of Mary Ann Greaves, 1895. Mary Ann Greaves, a woman from Newcastle, was mistakenly buried after being declared dead from heart disease. However, a grave digger heard faint knocking sounds from the coffin. They immediately retrieved her, and she was found to be alive but weak. She recovered and lived for several more years. With this in mind, we take a look in more detail of what being buried alive entailed. One of the earliest stories we have found comes from a pamphlet in 1661. The case, in short, involves the rather gruesome tale of Lawrence Cowthorne, a butcher from Newgate Market in 1661. From the most deplorable accident in 1661, the unfortunate turn of events for Cowthorne commenced in 1661 when he fell ill to an ailment that plagued him relentlessly. In the throes of his final moments, he was not graced 
with the presence of a physician, leaving the sombre duty of pronouncing death in the hands of lay persons. Alas, it was Lawrence's ill-fated misfortune to have his destiny intertwined with a malevolent landlady whose covetous eyes yearned for the spoils of his meagre possessions. Seeing the opportunity, she wasted no time in hastily declaring him deceased, leading to his prompt burial. However, fate, it seems, had a twist in store, with the confines of the chapel where Cowthorne's lifeless form was laid to rest. Mourners were gripped with terror when a stifled cry emanated from the tomb, accompanied by frenzied scratching against the coffin's walls and lid. The macabre spectacle horrified those present as the haunting sounds shattered the sombre ambience. Desperate to rectify their grave error, swift measures were taken to unearth the entombed individual. Alas, despite their earnest efforts, time proved a merciless adversary. When Cowthorne's motionless body was finally extricated from its sinister abode, the sight that unfolded was nothing short of ghastly. The once serene shroud now lay in tatters, a poignant testimony to a valiant struggle against impending doom. His eyes, grotesquely swollen, bore witness to unimaginable torment, and his battered and bleeding head stood as a chilling testament to the nightmarish ordeal endured in that unhallowed tomb. The lamentable fate of Lawrence Cowthorne serves as a stark reminder, cautioning us against the precarious nature of existence and the omnipresent threat of untimely burial. May this harrowing tale instil in us a profound sense of vigilance as we tread the fragile path of mortality. Among all the torments that humanity is capable of, the most dreadful of them is to be buried alive. Still, in the 17th century, this case from Basingstoke in 1674 tells the tale of a reportedly rather large woman. In the quaint town of Basingstoke, nestled amidst the English countryside, resided a woman of rather peculiar disposition by the name of Madame Blunden. She was known to possess an ample figure and a perchance for indulging in the finest brandy, a habit that had not gone unnoticed by the townsfolk. One fateful evening, an unrelenting illness seized hold of Madame Blunden, leaving her in a state of desolation. Seeking respite from her affliction, she dispatched her trusted messenger to the local apothecary, beseeching him to procure a vial of poppy water, an elixir renowned for its soothing properties. Unbeknownst to her, fate had interwoven a sinister thread into the tapestry of her existence. Having partaken of the poppy water, Madame Blunden succumbed to a deep slumber akin to the stillness of death itself. Alarmed by her lifeless countenance, her anxious family summoned the apothecary in a desperate bid for assistance. With a grave countenance, the apothecary declared that the woman had met her untimely end due to an overdose of the very concoction intended to alleviate her suffering. Her husband, William Blunden, a prosperous merchant in the malt trade, undertook the solemn duty of arranging his beloved wife's final rites. The sombre ceremony took place and the mournful procession wended its way to the hallowed grounds of the churchyard. The entombment proceeded, shrouding 
Mary Blunden's mortal remains beneath a veil of earth and grief. Yet, yet the ephemeral tranquillity of the grave was shattered within a fortnight's passing, startled by eerie utterances and melancholic wails emanating from the sepulchre, a group of schoolboys, engrossed in their playful escapades amidst the hallowed precincts, stumbled upon a macabre secret. Trembling with trepidation, they hastened to seek solace in the guidance of their learned schoolmaster. Together they ventured forth to unravel the enigma that lay beneath the dampened earth. With bated breath, they commenced the exhumation, the truth veiled in darkness waiting to be unveiled. Lo and behold, Madame Blunden's lifeless form emerged, a spectral spectre of death's icy grip. Though ostensibly deceased, her body bore unmistakable signs of struggle, a tapestry of fresh contusions and abrasions that spoke of her valiant efforts to escape the confines of her morbid confinement. The wounds, presumed to be self-afflicted, bore witness to her desperate struggle against the clutches of a premature interment. From these stories, we jump to 1884. This story also made the rounds within the famous medical journal, The Lancet. From the Illustrated Police News, 28th of June, 1884. A woman buried alive at Lanelli. Great interest has been awakened at Lanelli by a letter written to the Lancet by Canon Williams respecting the case of a woman who was supposed to have been buried alive. A woman of this town, aged 73, was buried in our cemetery 11 years ago. The grave was bricked and was made for two persons. A relation of hers had just died and is to be buried in the same grave the bricked grave being intended for two. There was a space of ten inches between the woman's coffin and three stone slabs resting on the sides of the grave. When the grave digger opened it, he was startled at finding that the lid of the coffin had been forced upwards against the stone slabs, leaving an opening. In this coffin, of about eight inches, the right arm and right leg of the woman's body were hanging over the left side of the coffin, and her face was lying sideways, or nearly downwards. The right knee was placed against the north side of the grave outside the coffin. I knew the woman well. Her friends say she suffered from asthma and had a long illness, but that for the two months before her death, she was attended by no medical assistance. In the register, the cause of her death is entered as unknown. There was no medical certificate. The body was kept in the house three clear days after death. I need hardly add that it seems to me that this is a matter of public interest. The possibility of people being buried alive is dreadful, to contemplate. Buried alive is bad enough. Having your fingers cut off whilst you are buried alive is a story that is hard to imagine. From the Illustrated Police News, 28th of June, 1903. Saved by her rings. The Vienna correspondent from the Daily Express sends particulars of an extraordinary incident which occurred last week. An almost incredible story of a girl being buried and leaving her grave is published in the papers here. The girl was Helena Fritosch, the daughter of a rich farmer at Ergetfeg in Hungary. She was buried on Wednesday with great pomp. The rings she wore were left on her fingers. 
At nine o'clock in the evening of the same day, there was a knock at the window of the sexton's house, and the sexton was horrified to see the face of the girl he had buried. Three fingers of her right hand were missing. She stated that she had been awakened by the feeling of great pain. On, on opening her eyes, saw two men climbing up a ladder from the grave. The top of the coffin had been smashed in by the men, whose object it was to steal the rings she wore. They had cut off her fingers, and it was the pain they caused that roused her from her death-like trance. From gruesome buried alive stories, we turn to this story from Kingston, Jamaica. This is one way to get some space from a partner. For our listeners, the Monica Professor within the story is written in quotes throughout. From the Illustrated Police News, the 17th of November, 1893. Hypnotised and buried alive. Professor W. A. Barclay, a Jamaican hypnotist, hypnotised his wife Friday, and in the presence of a large gathering of the public, buried her in a coffin under six feet of earth. The professor announced that he would leave his wife buried for six days, after digging her up again and reviving her, declaring that she would be as fit and as well as before burial. The ceremony took place at Gardens. The grave was already dug when the professor and his wife arrived, and the coffin placed in its side. Mrs. Barclay stepped into the coffin, lay out at full length, and closed her eyes peacefully. Professor Barclay, after making passes over his wife's head, announced that she was hypnotised and ready for burial. The coffin lid was then fastened down and the coffin was lowered into the grave. The earth was then piled up on the coffin to the depth of six feet. Barclay assured the people that his wife was not in the slightest degree affected by the burial and suffered no discomfort. In fact, he said, she was much better off than a good many of those who were walking on the earth. When the full details of the burial became known, a storm of protest was raised in Kingston. Mr. Forster Davis, who has control of Rockport Gardens, sent a letter on Saturday to Barclay declaring that he had no idea of the realistic character of the performance and added, In these circumstances, I must ask you to be good enough to make arrangements to disinter your wife this evening. Barclay, upon receiving the letter, replied that he had his word to the public that he would bury his wife alive for six days, and that he did not mean to break it. The matter, therefore, remains at complete standstill. The professor will not unbury his wife, and the authorities fear to do so owing to the possible consequences of removal. Sadly, we do not know the outcome of the event. We do know the consternation from the police and the authorities was immense. The next story also involves a knowingly purposeful burial alive, but with a very different purpose and outcome. From the Illustrated Police News, the 3rd of July, 1901, Man and Woman for Trial, alleged to have buried baby alive in a field. Lydia Binks, 24, described as a domestic servant of Carperby and Frederick Rushworth, 29, stated to be a farm labourer of Geltful Middleham, were charged before the magistrate at Leyburn, Wensleydale, with the murder of a female child aged three weeks, on March the 25th. Mr. E. G. Roby for the prosecution said that the woman was married but was separated from her husband and she was understood by people who had employed her to be single. Rushworth was a farm labourer and for the past 18 months the two had been seen keeping company. 
The prosecution alleged that on March the 1st, the woman gave birth to a female child secretly, the only person knowing of this being a Mrs. Sayer. Mrs. Sayer had formerly employed the prisoner Lydia Binks. Mrs. Binks asked Mrs. Sayer to sign an insurance form so that she, the prisoner Lydia Binks, might get maternity benefit. Baby in a Basket Eight days after the birth, Mr. Radcliffe, who employed Lydia Binks, saw her with the child. Mrs. Binks represented to him that she was taking care of it for a few days as the mother was ill in hospital. On March the 25th, Mr. Radcliffe saw Binks on a bicycle. She had the baby in a basket attached to the bicycle. Mrs. Binks told him that she was taking the baby away. As far as the prosecution knew, the prisoners met later that day and between them buried the baby in the basket two feet deep in a lonely field. On July the 12th, police officers accompanied Lydia Binks to the field and the body was found. The Cell Interviews While in custody, Rushworth was seen by his brother and sister and a police sergeant overheard the conversations. The sister asked, You did not do this terrible crime? Rushworth replied, No, I helped to bury it. That's all. She brought it five miles on her bicycle. At another interview, the sister asked him, You did not kill it, Fred, did you? He replied, No, she did. Sir Bernard Spilbury, describing his examination of the body, said that there was no external marks of injury and no marks of constriction on the surface. A small quantity of earth was found inside the mouth and the stomach of the infant. The cause of death, in his opinion, was by a live burial. When we hear of cases of being buried alive, our mind pictures Georgian Regency and Victorian times. Surely these types of mistakes could not happen in more relatively modern times. As one can see from the several cases of being buried alive recounted, there was a real fear regarding this. The answer was a Victorian invention. During the Victorian era, the fear of premature burial gripped the minds of people. In response to this anxiety, inventors and undertakers devised various safety measures, including the creation of safety coffins. These specialised coffins aimed to provide a way for those mistakenly buried alive to escape their grim fate. The Invention of Safety Coffins To address the fear of premature burial, inventors and undertakers came up with various mechanisms and designs for safety coffins. These coffins were equipped with features intended to allow the occupant to signal their presence or escape in case they were mistakenly buried alive. Bell and rope systems. One common safety feature was the inclusion of a bell above the grave connected to a rope or string inside the coffin. If the person woke up inside the coffin, they could pull the string, causing the bell to ring above ground, alerting those nearby to their predicament. Breathing tubes and escape hatches. Some safety coffins incorporated small tubes or pipes that extended from the coffin to the surface, providing a source of air for the occupant. In more elaborate designs, escape hatches or trapdoors were built into the coffin, allowing the person inside to crawl out if necessary. Ventilation and viewing windows. Certain safety coffins featured ventilation tubes or perforated sections to ensure a supply of fresh air. 
Additionally, some designs included small viewing windows or transparent panels enabling mourners to observe the face of the deceased, searching for signs of life before burial. Although primarily born out of genuine concern, these coffins also tapped into the public's fascination with death and the macabre. Safety coffins eventually lost their popularity as medical science advanced. However, even within the 20th century, occasion of being buried alive still occurred within Europe. From the Illustrated Police News on 10th of January 1935, Mother of Eight Buried Alive. A story of a woman, the mother of eight children, being buried alive and dying afterwards from the shock of finding herself in a coffin comes from the Yugoslav village of Kropina. The woman had tuberculosis for ten years. When she became unconscious, she was presumed to be dead and was buried the same afternoon. The sexton did not fill in the grave immediately. When at dawn next day, whilst he resumed his work, he heard noises proceeding from the coffin. Fearing that he had heard a ghost, the gravedigger ran to the village priest who referred him to the mayor as the only man who could authorise the opening of the coffin. The mayor referred him to the town clerk. After an hour of argument, the mayor, the clerk and the priest were persuaded to accompany the gravedigger to the cemetery. The coffin was opened, the woman was found to have turned over in the coffin with her features distorted and her hands bleeding from her vain efforts at wrapping the lid. We finish this episode with a favourite tale of ours, the story of John McIntyre, April 1824, being buried alive but saved by his resurrectionist, otherwise known as grave robbers. From the broadside, 18th of April, 1824, a miraculous circumstance. Being a full and particular account of John McIntyre, who was buried alive in Edinburgh on the 15th day of April, 1824, while in a trance, and who was taken up by the resurrection men and sold to the doctors to be dissected with a full account of the many strange and wonderful things which he saw and felt whilst he was in that state, the whole thing being taken from his own words. I had been some time ill of a low and lingering fever. My strength gradually wasted, and I could see by the doctors that I had nothing to hope. One day, towards evening, I was seized with strange and indescribable quivering, I saw around my bed innumerable strange faces. They were bright and visionary and without bodies. There was a light and solemnity, and I tried to move but could not. I could recollect with perfectness, but the power of motion had departed. I heard the sound of weeping at my pillow and the voice of the nurse saying, He is dead. I cannot describe what I felt at these words. I exerted my utmost power to stir myself, but I could not move even an eyelid. The world then darkened. My father drew his hand over my face and closed my eyelids. The world was then darkened, but I could still hear and feel and suffer. For three days, a number of friends called to see me. I heard them in their low accents speak of what I was, and more than one touched me with his finger. The coffin was then procured, and I was lain in it. I felt the coffin lifted and borne away. I heard and felt it placed in the hearse, and it halted, and the coffin was taken out. I felt myself carried on the shoulders of men. I heard the cords of the coffin moved. I felt it swing as dependent by them. 
it was lowered and rested upon the bottom of the grave. Buried alive. Dreadful was the effort I then made to exert my power of action, but my whole frame was immovable. The sound of the rattling mould as it covered me was far more tremendous than thunder. This also ceased, and all was silent. This is death, I thought, and soon the worms will be crawling about my flesh. In the contemplation of this hideous thought I heard a low sound in the earth above me, and I fancied the worms and reptiles were coming. The sound continued to grow louder and nearer. Can it be possible, though, that my friends suspect that they have buried me too soon? The hope was truly like bursting through the gloom of death. The sound ceased. They dragged me out of the coffin by the head and carried me swiftly away. The corpse's fate. When born some distance, I was thrown down like a clod, and by the interchange of one or two brief sentences, I discovered that I was in the hands of those robbers who live by plundering the grave and selling bodies or parents and children and friends. Being rudely stripped of my shroud, I was placed naked on a table. In a short time, I heard by the bustle in the room that the doctors and students were assembling. When all was ready, the demonstrator took his knife and pierced my bosom. I felt a dreadful cracking, as it were, through my whole frame, a convulsive shudder instantly followed, and a shriek of horror rose from all present. The ice of death was broken up. My trance was ended. The utmost exertions were made to restore me, and in the course of one hour I was in full possession of all my faculties. That concludes this episode of Twisted Tale Tuesdays, Stories of Being Buried Alive. We really hope you enjoyed the show. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload five days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-17th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. And Wednesdays will become Wicked Wednesdays at the conclusion of the Whitechapel Wednesday series. In this new series, we'll be looking at some of the shocking events, bloody places and outrageous organisations of their day. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>